I'm here to introduce you a bit to what it all means about Mozilla, because we found out that it's, we're not that known here, funnily enough. And uh, my job at Mozilla is to be the spokesperson for HTML5 and the open web, which means that I'm speaking a lot with other engineers, help them out to shift from closed technologies to open technologies. I talk a lot with the press about not saying bad things or too good things about HTML5 and actually make people aware about the benefits of it rather than like, oh, this is a new shiny thing. Because in the press we had a lot of HTML5 things. This is what Flash did five years ago, but only slower. And that's not the right way of selling something. So I wrote a long article about it, which we're going to come to later. So um, to start with, if you don't know what Mozilla did, Mozilla was actually there when the internet was almost locked up. When I was young and still had my hair, uh, we, there, was, uh, there was this Internet Explorer thing, and it was the best browser out there, and everybody thought you would only need to build for that. So that's why we have all these websites right now that are awful, and really, really look bad, and they're really hard to use, because they were built for one browser, and no browser ever again. So uh, as Internet Explorer was bundled with the operating system, there was no choice. So you basically had to use the thing. And a lot of users didn't care, because it came with the operating system. Yeah, the Internet is that blue E thing. But it was a company that locked you in. The browser itself was not open source. We didn't know, you couldn't fiddle with the browser, you couldn't do anything with it. You were at the beck and call of a corporation and their goals. So when they actually uh, strong-armed Netscape into out of the market really, Mozilla came around. And Mozilla is a non-for-profit organization to actually keep the web open and free. So what we did is we came up with a browser that does the same things as Internet Explorer, but actually in an open fashion, open source browser built by a community and not by a corporation. Non nothing in Firefox is actually locked up. Nothing in Firefox happens without you knowing it. Whereas other browsers, it can happen that your searches get actually indexed and, get, and some ads will be shown to you or things like that. So in Firefox, you have full control over the browser and you have full control as a developer as well. And when something annoys you about Firefox, you can go to Bugzilla and complain about it. You don't go to me on Twitter and complain about it and hope that I talk to the engineers, which happens every three minutes on this planet. You can go to Bugzilla and describe what's the problem with it, and the browser gets better the more people complain. Complain in a good fashion, not like, oh, this is ugly. So we need to know what your problems are. So, and as Firefox came around, it's the first browser to open that and say like, hey, hang on, this is not standardized. What HTML, uh, what HTML was with Internet Explorer was a lot of extensions that only Microsoft used that weren't open for other browsers to do. So a lot of the things that they implemented, other browsers could not implement. Whereas we had standards of the web that well, allegedly developers should build things for. But Internet Explorer didn't do anything with the standards. So we were the browser to say, OK, use the W3C standards. In our browser, it works. Let's make that work for all the browsers out there. And that's how we opened the door for things like Chrome, Safari, and now Internet Explorer as well. The new Internet Explorer is still a closed browser, but it's a really, really good browser because it supports the web standards out there and not their own things anymore. So they don't come up with something that nobody else can use, but they use what everybody else does as well. So one of the big things of HTML5 and the new web world that we have right now is that all the browsers show websites in the same way. So when I was a web developer, when I started 14 years ago, my biggest selling point was I knew how browsers mess up. I know how, what to do so it looks, it looks almost OK across all of them. But that is wasting our time. This is not what we should be doing as developers. We should be building things that actually are engaging, are interesting. So with HTML5 and new browsers we have out there now, we have a good opportunity to build good things. So Firefox, as the browser, opened the door for all these open innovation on the web, like uh, Chrome, based on Chromium, which is also an open source engine. Uh, Opera does a lot, uh, a lot of standards work. The browser itself is not open source. Safari is based on WebKit as well. It's also an open source engine, but not quite fully open source anymore. And Internet Explorer will never be open source, but at least they're, all, they're supporting standards now on Windows. Sadly enough, I can't use it on my Mac. So. What we do though, a lot of people say, like, oh, great, you Firefox, and I, I like Chrome, we don't need you anymore, and it's like, that's the most boring thing to talk to me about, because Mozilla is much more than Firefox alone. And we've been doing that uh, thing, that open source thing, and the open web thing for so long, 
and we are there to be the last company or the last entity to actually say, we don't make money with what you want to do. We help you out to learn the web and we help you to actually understand the web standards the way they are. So a few things that we do aside of it is like we do this web maker thing. We just had the Mozilla Festival in London, that's why I look tired. I've been there for two days and flew directly here afterwards. Which, uh, where, we in, where we invite journalists and we invite teachers and we invite children to start playing with the web, to understand that nothing on the web is closed, that to understand that looking at these slides, you can actually edit them and do something with it, that under the hood, everything on the web is hackable and changeable. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. They're just like, oh, this is horrible, I'm going to go another one. Everybody on the web can be a maker and can be a consumer. On tablets and on phones, much more of a consumer than a maker, but on the web, you can know everybody's invited. When I started on the web, I was a radio journalist, and I was interviewing people, and they had nothing interesting to say, and I knew people that had interesting things to say, but they weren't on radio, because they weren't famous, or they didn't pay a lot of money to be on radio. Then the internet came around, and I'm like, wait, you can have interesting people on a medium without having to pay for it? That's amazing. So I quit my job, I taught myself HTML, and I got a job at BMW, because back then I was one of five people that wrote HTML or something like that. But with the, with the webmaker stuff, we give that opportunity to everybody out there. And it's great to see teachers understand, like, oh my god, I can teach my school kids to make their own website with, with, within a few minutes? That's really not hard to do. We got this wonderful system called, um, yeah, called uh, Thimble. Symbol is a, an editor that allows you to show, to show the HTML and see the output immediately. And when you make mistakes, it gives you human readable mistakes. And not like object is not an object or undefined is not defined, like Internet Explorer always gave you. You're like, I know that undefined is not defined. What are you doing here? And I've been playing with it a bit as well. So um, you can do amazing stuff with that. So if you just go to the symbol page originally, uh, there's, there's little things that if you have kids or if you have uh, friends that I just want to try, you can pick a project here and you can say, for example, make your own animal. And in this one, it shows you the, uh, that's together with the London Zoo, where you can actually um, make the project, you see the HTML on the left hand side and the output and the output on the other side. And there's lots of explanations what to do. So in this case, it tells you like, okay, Here's unknown.png, but you can change that to an animal picture. And uh, if I knew now what the animal pictures were, you have, for example, those. So if you scroll down here and you see that image, you say, like, okay, a hidden at all PNG. All I have to do is copy that one, copy it into the first one uh, instead of the unknown.png, and I got my head in that one. That's interesting. Okay, it works, I promise that. So what I did, for example, with that, when a few people asked me what you can do with it, is this one here, where you, instead of the edit, you can always just delete the edit and see the results. Oh yeah, wonderful. Okay, reload. Huh? There we go. So this, this, this here, for example, doesn't use anything that is JavaScript or Flash or anything like that. All of this stuff can be done with CSS nowadays. So you can do a Star Wars scroller just by editing a bit of HTML and putting your own text in. And that is all that was necessary. So these kind of things to allow people to play with the web and to make them understand that nothing is locked is what, uh, what Mozilla is about when it comes to the WebMaker project that we're doing here. So let me find my slides again, which are here. The other thing that we just released last weekend, actually, uh, is the Popcorn Maker for Popcorn.js. Mozilla Popcorn is a, um, a tool to make video editable. So imagine you go to YouTube and you find a good video and you could right click it and put your own text on top of it. Or you could take a video and mix it with another video or put an image on top of that. So what you had to buy a lot of software for in the past and learn a lot about it, like uh, Final Cut Pro or whatever you used for the video editing, nowadays you can do on the web. And the Popcorn Maker has an interface, much like Flash has, to, uh, to actually edit a, a video together and then send it to your friends. And your friends can then re-edit it and send it back to you. So with Popcorn Maker and Popcorn JS, which is a JavaScript library under it, 
They make video as, uh, as editable as text on the web. And there's a great tech talk by one of my colleagues actually explaining what Popcorn Maker is. And a lot of filmmakers came up to us last weekend at the MozFest and they start using that now to make interactive documentaries on the web. Rather than having to film them and mix them and create a lot of videos, you just put some text on top of it. Or a map or another video. So you can mix and match everything on the web and we made video read and writable. Persona is, I'm just going to go quickly on that, uh, it's a logging system for the web. We found out that everybody has usernames and passwords and we always forget the passwords. And then we use the same password everywhere or we use clever names like password123. If you're really clever, we use password456 because nobody comes up with that one, right? So we looked at all these systems and said like, what happens when you forget your password? It sends you an email to reset your password. So why doesn't the email become your identity? So in Persona, uh, all you have to do is sign up for Persona once, and then your email becomes your identity. And the system that will allows you to log in with Persona, you just need to click a button and tell them, this is my email here, and you never have to uh, have a username and password again. Because we want to make the web more secure, and usernames and passwords are just a very, very stupid idea. But all in all, we like, okay, we made video editable, we made the web editable, we freed the desktop, and uh, nobody has to use Internet Explorer only anymore. Because if we hadn't been there back then, the internet would not be what it is today. It would be just in offices, and it would be just for business things, like booking rooms and booking flights and stuff like that. There wouldn't be something like YouTube. There wouldn't be as much creativity out there on the web if we hadn't opened it. But the new challenge is that the web is moving away from these desktops or laptop machines to everything. Like we have these great mobile phones now that actually render web content and show you web content and everybody runs around with a tablet and nobody has the newest one and there, there's like, it, when you look at it where the web is going right now, it's everywhere. Tell, uh, 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 TV set-top boxes, game consoles, 20% of, uh, of the teenagers in England only surf on their PlayStation or their Xbox. They don't use a computer at all, they just play their games and in between they surf some things and it was just like, as a web developer, we're always like, yeah, we want to make it look perfect everywhere. This is not possible anymore. So we have to understand that our content, our sites, have to change according to what we give it there. And we have a lot of broken promises. That was always my big thing. That when HTML5 came out and Apple announced it as like, okay, that's the death of Flash. You don't need Flash anymore. Everything is HTML5. I was like, yes. Good. I wrote a lot of HTML5. I'm very happy about the standard. I'm very. This is cool. And the problem is now that when you write a lot of things in HTML5, it's not as good as native code on these phones. It doesn't give you access to all the hardware. And a mobile phone system or a website on a mobile phone shouldn't have to me to type in an address. I should have a button saying like "Find me" and find my location, and it automatically fills it in. That is possible in the browser on a desktop, it's not possible on all mobile phones. And I cannot access the accelerometer for navigation, I cannot access the text messaging service or emailing service, the address book. On my, on my computer, if I pick an email address and I put input type email, it can get the content that I have in my address book. On a mobile phone, HTML5 is not allowed to do that. So we thought, okay, that's the next barrier that we have to break. Because it's unfair that we get HTML, we get the promise of it, and then we don't get the performance or the way to actually access it on the phone. Because when, when Apple released and others said, like, okay, HTML5 is awesome, look what our browsers can do on, uh, on mobile phones, and then they realized out of a sudden, like, hey, selling applications makes you a lot of money. So why should we make HTML5 really good when nobody has to upload the apps to our market, but you can put it anywhere on the web? So it seems deliberate that HTML5 is not really working well on all devices out there. So we thought, okay, we've got to do something about this. Here's another barrier that Mozilla has to break. So first of all, Firefox is available on Android. If you don't have it yet, try it out. It actually is faster than the, well, the, 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 the out-of-the-box browser that comes with Android has to die. That thing is the new Internet Explorer 6. That thing will haunt us for the next two years. The, it, it doesn't do HTML5 properly. It doesn't, have, it doesn't do any of the storage facilities, offline storage. All the things that make an app good don't work properly on it. That's why, Apple came, that's why Google came up with Chrome for Android. But it's still not the browser that everybody has to have on it. If a new phone comes out, it can still use the stock browser. And that one is just awful. 
And the problem with an awful browser that comes with the hardware is that 90% of the users will use it because they don't want to download another browser. But if you look at Firefox, for example, for Android, you can do all the things that you do on your desktop with Firefox, and it will sync up to your phone. So you can actually go there and look at some sites, and it will pop up as soon as you go back, these kind of things. I think in between your devices is very, very nice. And it's fast, it's, it's secure, it's, uh, and it actually gives you the same freedom that Firefox gives you on your desktop. So not everything you do is tracked. It's an interesting, uh, interesting system. I've got it on my, uh, on my Google phone and uh, in all kinds of versions, and it works. It really is the fastest browser I have right now. And let's hope the others catch up, let's, but let's hope that the browser system will be better as well. So if you're a developer, of course, Firefox was traditionally always the thing with Firebug. Firebug made me a web developer, or well, made me happy as a web developer, because before that, I had alerts to actually change, test my JavaScript. And then when the alert is out of a sudden in a, in a loop, and you basically stand and like bing, 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 in an endless loop, you have to actually kill your, kill your browser and start it again. That was not fun. So we now have developer tools in, in the browser built in, and Fire, uh, Firebug is still available as well which has lots of good features. I mean, if you, if you look at the inspect element here, you get all kind of cool stuff. You, do the, you analyze the HTML, you can jump around, you can delete parts of the page, like for example, add pop-ups and these kind of things. Or you can look at the source of something. So if you download a, a video that you can't download, you just right click it here, but I didn't tell you that. Um, you find out if you added the CSS or if it actually has been computed by the, by the machine for you. You can, look at the, uh, you can look at the dimensions of the thing. And all the things that you expect from a development environment is already in the browser. So a lot of people would always say, oh, HTML5 doesn't have a development environment. Yes, it has. It's the browser. It's the thing that our end users consume it in that we build it in. How cool is that? And you get really fancy things like a little scratch pad as well. If you want to write a massive JavaScript, instead of, uh, instead of going in the console, you can write a JavaScript here that will run in that page a long one to try it out and actually highlight lines by, line by line to test things out. Uh, same with Safari, same with Chrome, same with Opera, same with Internet Explorer. We all have developer tools that are in there. And that's just wonderful that the thing that you use uh, is the one that you actually build it in. What the others don't have is that cool 3D view, which looked like a strange thing first, but that actually shows you how deep the DOM is, so how deep your HTML goes. So if you look at this one here, so this one is the header, and it goes down to an H1, and you can highlight them and right-click them in any ways. And you see how complex your HTML gets that way. So if you, for example, want to visit Facebook City, you just do an inspect element here, and you go to a 3D view, and then you see what Facebook is doing, which is pretty interesting, but what can you do? A really cool thing that we have uh, is a responsive view. So if you build for mobile devices and you don't want to put it on the mobile device all the time or resize your browser, that's in there as well. So uh, this one, for example, is a website I just built and I wanted to see what it looks like on smaller screens. So normally what you do with that is you re resize your browser and then you see, okay, it falls back to this one column here and as soon as you're bigger, it jumps into this one and it has a fancier interface rather than just jumping down to the page. Again, this is CSS only. I didn't have to do anything extra there. But it's annoying for me to resize my browser, because if I have the developer tools open, for example, I have to resize the developer tools as well. And then out of a sudden, it doesn't show me what the screen is anymore. So instead of using that one, you can use the responsive view. And what that one allows you to do is uh, simulate different sizes. So I can say, OK, what is this on a first generation iPhone? It's 320 by 480. But the rest of the screen stays the same sizes. So you can actually have your dev tools in the screen, and you have different resized uh, elements in there. So you can rotate it as well, and you can say 800 by whatever that device is. So instead of having to resize your browser all the time, you do it in the browser, which is much, much easier to do as well. So back to where we are. This is my friend's desktop. He needs to clean up a bit. <laughs> So this is what the responsive, responsive view does. We have remote debugging as well, and that Chrome has that one as well. I don't know if Microsoft has it yet, but if not, they should be soon, and we will email them about it. Because send, writing your code, packaging it up, sending it to mobile phone, finding out that you forgot something is really annoying. 
So what responsive view does is you actually see your code on the mobile device, but you debug it on your desktop. So all the error messaging and all the uh, all the, the, the code uh, code messages are actually in your desktop, but the rest you see it on the phone. Because simulating it in the browser and then seeing it on the phone are two different things. Like you should always test it on the device that you want to have it on, because that's where the interaction happens. So that's where remote debugging comes in. It's a very useful thing. Now, as I has hinted before, I said before we have a hardware lockout. I don't have access to everything my phone has in JavaScript, and that's unfair. I mean, on the desktop, it doesn't lock me out. On the desktop, I can access things. I can do cool things. I can, I mean, I can access cameras. I can, uh, I can do local storage. I get all the things that make a new application more interesting than it did before. I can edit. Uh, I can use Canvas to edit uh, images on the fly. I can change things. I have this, for example, this Canvas cropper here. Uh, canvas thumber. So there's lots of the webrocks.com demos and stuff that I write when I'm bored. And uh, there's this cropper that shows you, for example, if you, build an oper if you build a content management system and you want to allow people to upload images of vomiting unicorns in this case, you can right click it and uh, you can say crop. And then you just crop the part of the image that you want, you double click it and the image is edited without a server, without any JavaScript, without, well, with JavaScript, but without any Flash, without any Java. And you can do these things nowadays. You can upload and change images in the browser, but on, uh, on a mobile phone, I'm not allowed to do that, and that is not right. So what we did instead, we came up with specifications. Again, there were no specifications about accessing hardware. And we said, okay, we need those. So we wrote these web APIs, they're called. And this is basically a mobile phone dismantled um, and all the things it can do, like camera access, WebGL for 3D gaming, geolocation, find you on the planet, battery API, web vibration API to make your mobile phone vibrate. And all of these are standards now that we defined, that we use in Firefox. We open them to other browsers as well. If they want to implement them, please do. Maybe it's we're happy with that. We don't keep that stuff for ourselves. And the, the, uh, the main message here was like, this stuff is there. Why can't we access it? And with the web, uh, web API work, we made all of these available. So everything that's green here is available already. And everything that's red is going to be implemented by you as soon as you go home tonight. Because it's open source and you can please help us with that. Um, and, okay, so what do we do with this? Um, it's great that we open it, but it's, if it's just a standard, it's not good enough. So we have an open web device that we're working together with Telefonica on. And uh, Telefonica is one of our partners. We, all, we work with a few others as well. And they want to have a mobile phone that is web-enabled, that actually gets you on the web without having to spend six months wage for your new phone that you get out there. So um, what they want to get out for a market that cannot afford normal iPhones or Androids is a, is a small phone that runs on open software and, and HTML5. And this is what the open web device is. Now, we don't build this device because we're not a hardware company and we don't sell hardware. That would be a very stupid move that some other companies tried to sell hardware the first time around and burnt, got very much burned by that. So instead, we partner with people like Telefonica and others and we build the operating system together with them as well. Like a lot of the people working on the Firefox OS, as it's called, as you might have, might have guessed by now, are actually from providers and are not from us. We're working with other companies on that. So we put Firefox, the engine, on a mobile device. So instead of having a level, uh, a level above, like uh, you have like, um, I'll show you in a second. Everything runs on HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript in Firefox OS. The whole phone, not only the apps, the phone as well. And that's just incredible if you think about it. So we have three levels here. We have, uh, we have uh, GOG, which is the low-level operating system, which is the same as running on Android. It's the Linux kernel that runs on Android as well. And then we looked at, at the Java level, and we said, eh, no. And we looked at the, uh, at the uh, C level and other levels that other operating systems have, and then eh. So instead, we, get, we put Firefox on there, the rendering engine that is inside Firefox, which is called Gecko, um, because it's an animal. I don't know why they chose it. And on top, we have a thing called Gaia. Gaia is an interface that actually is written in HTML5, JavaScript, and CSS, and accesses the hardware through these web APIs that we talked about. 
So if you want to build things for Firefox OS, you write a web product, like you would do in the browser as well, and you put it on the phone and it will work. And if you, uh, if you build something, uh, uh, you cannot access the, the, the level anymore, because the, the other level anymore. A lot of people ask me, hey, I want to write Java for, you, for, for Firefox OS, but there is no Java. So no, you can't, sorry. You have to actually use these things that the world uses rather than Java, which all people use. Um, and what that gives us is a massive interface flexibility. Because as the operating system is an HTML page, I can hack around with the interface very easily. I can actually build my own thing, my own interface. We, we just provide one now. We built Gaia to get the first rounds of phones out that looks in a certain way, but it doesn't have to. You could build your own phone with that with three buttons on it, saying like, call mom, order pizza, go home. You can build little phones that are, that are for companies that only need five apps and not like allow their, their, their users to have every app on this planet and get malware on it. So that's all possible to hack the interface of the operating system itself. So how can you play with Firefox OS? You can run it in Firefox and Firefox Nightly. You can do that right now. There's, there's simulators, there's emulators. Use a desktop simulator, which is a bit clutchy, but it works. Or you can build your own device if you're really, really hardcore, which normally I wouldn't advise people to do because we don't need you to build Firefox OS. We do that. What we need you to do is build apps for it, which is much, much easier and much, much more fun because you don't want to build an operating system and get complaints that the button doesn't look right. There's lots of lots of lists. These slides will be online as well later on, so you don't have to write that down right now. There's a repository on GitHub. The whole code is on GitHub. There's nothing secret there. Uh, there is an architecture document on, uh, on the wiki. There's a Gaia repo just for the interface. And there's developer docs as well for out there if you want to build something with it. Now, I've, we have a few phones around, I think. Um, I bricked my other one, so this one is working for a change. So this is what it looks like. This is a phone running HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. Nothing else on there, and the thing works. And it, uh, we can use it to make calls if I had a SIM card in it. And it's actually a really, really fun device. Jeff, after me, will talk to you right now about the simulator that we have in the browser right now that when you go uh, and you install that one, you can go to Tools and you can go to Web Developer and a Firefox OS simulator. And then you have a dashboard here that tells you what's going on. And you can start the, opera uh, the operating system and start developing on your hard drive immediately and write for this, this operating system. And the fun thing is, like, how many of these things are actually defined? So I have, I have a normal phone here. I can make this call and can, like, like any other phone does. Like, when you try to get a SIM card here, you know how, to, how many numbers you have to type in before you actually have some access to the Internet. And when you look at the code of that, it's actually uh, very simple. Well, it's not simple, but it's HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. And you say, for example, here the inbuilt apps where I have the system app, I think it's Dyler, isn't it? Whoa, that changed a bit. But anything that is in the system itself here is actually JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, and you can start playing with it. So the original index for the HTML page for the operating system is here. This is how, what an operating system looks like in Firefox OS. <laughs> And that's pretty sweet, if you think about it. It has a Chrome ID in there. That's pretty cool. Anyways. Um, so you've got a dashboard here where you can add your directory, but I'm not going to take away uh, Jeff's talk because he's going to hit me if I do. This was my email. You shouldn't be reading that. That's fine. Where are my talks again? Damn it. Mozilla. There we go. So, of course, a uh, mobile device, a smash uh, a device without apps is pretty pointless. So we offer you to build apps with us. HTML5 apps that you can put on the web and be happy there with it and actually submit it with a manifest file to our app market and then you can install it on the Firefox devices that are coming out next year. And the good thing about that is you don't need to do any extra. You don't need to go through a process like in other web and other markets where you have to write it in an extra language and then in another language for another one, another language for another one. You just write in HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript, and you get it into the market, and you also get it into the web. And as they are web applications, one thing we're playing with right now, it's not quite there yet, but if I had the phone that wasn't broken, I could show you, is that you could do a search on the web 
And instead of getting the results of websites, you get the results of apps. So the web could become, could become your app market. Because that's another problem. If I now find a good, uh, a good Android app, and I write it, I, and I submit it to the Android market, I in between 60,000 other apps. Whereas if I put it on the web and other people link to it, the more people link to it, the more interesting it gets, the easier it will be found later on. That was a question? No, okay. And that's pretty sweet to have like the idea of, uh, of out of a sudden the search results in Google could be apps. And that's pretty, pretty interesting for, uh, for us as app developers to get our stuff found rather than calling it exclamation mark, exclamation mark, AAA. So if somebody lists an alphabetically we were the first app. So what can you do? How can you help us with that? I know you're all sold now, so you really want to do something. Um, you can code, you can write apps, contribute to Gaia itself, uh, contribute to B2G. Use the marketplace, use the web APIs and play with them. They're all uh, open source on GitHub, try them out. Try them out in Firefox. When you find bugs, please tell us about it. Give us input on APIs. What is missing? What else could be there? Are there operating, are there mobile devices here that we don't know about that would be interesting to support as well? And give us feedback about it. So hacks.mozilla.org is our main developer blog. So that's where we write all the cool developer content. And there's a few good posts that you can actually look at right now. One of them is called, that I wrote for the press, is called HTML5 Myth Busting. And uh, I, I basically put like all the things that I got from, from the press and put it together in one blog post. So that's good. Um, that's the other one. That's the other one. Oh, is that the one I killed? Good. So basically, when I talk to the press and I talk to people who don't know about the web, they always came up with these messages and said, like, okay, somebody told me the HTML5 performance is bad. HTML5 doesn't perform. So I'm explaining here why it doesn't perform in uh, the same way a native application does. Then people ask me, like, it cannot be monetized. And I show them the, our app store. And I show them that a lot of apps that you see in the Apple store or see in the Android store are actually written in HTML5 and just converted with PhoneGap. That you can do as well. You cannot get an Android app and convert it with PhoneGap into HTML, but the other way around always works. Then people keep telling me that it cannot be offline. And you can very much make an HTML5 app offline. That was the whole HTML5 standard was about then. It has no development environment. The browser is your development environment. And it actually, uh, here's a few things that HTML5 can do that native apps can't do. So I'm putting a lot of these together and then showing you where to get uh, Firefox OS and what's going on. There's a blog post about all the presentations and documentation on Firefox OS. So if you want to watch these videos in your leisure time, that's also possible as well. All of them are available on YouTube. You can download them as well. And there's a great post on hacking Firefox OS, how you can actually play with the inter uh, interface yourself and debug it and see what's going on and get your first app running if you wanted to. And one demo that is basically that I showed that shows you like that, uh, that the performance of HTML5 is fine is that game which is also open source on GitHub. And this is a WebGL game running in your browser right now. And I suck at games, so this is gonna be painful for me to show. But I mean, this one is now running in the browser here. And of course, this is a beefy machine, but it also works on my old Chromebook or my old machine out at home. So these kind of things are possible in an open fashion like we had before. And these games are hackable as well as I showed before. So have, using Canvas and WebGL, we've got all the things in the, in the browser that we need. This is another thing that we do, hackagame.org, which is uh, the same as Thimble that I showed you earlier, but for games. So here we have a simple Pong game where you can actually see when, you're, when the browser is big enough. Good, you can't. But you can play Pong here against your friends and you can actually change the HTML to do the Pong differently. And there's so many simple things that you can do nowadays. You could tilt it in 3D space, you can make it a bigger paddle, you can turn it around and all of a sudden you have, have a conoid, which is actually a, a Pong with more than one paddle, if you think about it. Fixed paddles. So these are also originally meant for kids, but actually get started with playing games and with writing games. It's a very simple start for you as well. So back to the last slide, I think, or so. Yeah. So that's all I had. So uh, I'm handing over to Jeff, who's going to talk to you about the R2D2P2G, which is the very short and simple name we have for the Firefox emulator. Da -da 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 -da. Da -da -da and. <laughs> 
that's me. I'm available on GitHub as CodePoet if you want to if you want to pester me on CodePoet uh, uh, on GitHub and on Twitter. And these slides I'm uploading as soon as he's going on stage, so he doesn't have a good connection anymore. So I thank you very much. <laughs>